first tennis coach that reached out to me was through, I think I did an analysis um, and just put something up on Instagram. It may, may have been on LinkedIn as well, I can't recall, but he saw it on Instagram. He reached out and he said, look, I have a player who's ranked 140 in the world. I like what you did. Could you do something similar for, for the player? And I thought I thought he was having me on the first time. And I, <laughs> I, I was like, who is this guy? This is an Italian guy halfway across the world. Um, but yeah, it, it came out of that. And G'day guys, coming up on the show today, we have Shane Leonard. Shane is the founder and principal consultant of data-driven sports analytics. Shane is an incredible guy with a fantastic understanding of tennis and the numbers that drive performance. Before he got into performance analytics, he was a business analyst at the federal and state government, then at Cricket Australia before starting his own analytics work in tennis that led him to work with the recent Australian Open champion, Arena Sabalenka. Lost look out for including how he got into performance analytics, what he looks for during his analysis, and a deep dive in what you need to know about his field. Let's go. I started volunteering. It's all about who you know in sport. Am I going to be calling the last 10 seconds of the grand final? You can connect with the interviewer. The hand goes up when they've got to make a decision. Having a network is one of the most important things you can do. I didn't necessarily follow my passion. I followed my curiosity. Once you've worked in sport, there's no going back. And then lo and behold, before I left, I got offered two. Hello and welcome to the Sports Grad Podcast, your bite-sized guide to enter the sports industry. I'm Ryan Walker. Joining me is the Pilgrim, Reuben Williams. We are two mates who met at Cricket Australia and each week we learn how people made it in the sports industry and then tease out their career decisions, work habits, skills and all the things they do to make them great. So you can learn how to get your first job or your next job in sport and progress your career. Rubes, how are you, mate? It's good to be back. Mate, it's so good to be back. I haven't been in this room for a long, long time. It feels good to be home. It does. The last few months have just been hectic. Uh, Pilgrim is probably <laughs> appropriate. <laughs> I um uh we did our last episode from I was in the World Cup for our last episode yes. last year over in Qatar. That was absolutely incredible. If you want to hear my thoughts, it's in that episode. Yeah. And then I uh, came home from that. Christmas and New Year's wasn't terribly relaxing. And then on the <laughs> 2nd of January, I jetted off to India for a six-day wedding where when I arrived, the first thing they said to me is, tomorrow you're going to be a part of a choreographed dance on stage in front of 200 people. So you've got this afternoon to practice. Enjoyed the wedding for six days yep. and then uh, uh, had a bit of time in Goa before going to Mumbai where connected with three universities who we do some work with, gave some presentations. And then as soon as I got back, it was straight up to Brisbane for another wedding and then back down the East Coast for our meetups in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. And uh, yeah, I'm pooped, but it's so uh, now, we're not, here. now we're here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it has been a little while. I must say I've missed this room. It's great to be back in the studio mm. uh, doing the podcast like we did when you were in India. It, it wasn't as good. We, 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 no. we love being in the studio together. Mm. Uh, but, yeah, I must say that is a genuine fear of mine. <laughs> if I rocked up to a mate's wedding and was told within a day that you're going to be part of the dance crew, <laughs> I'd probably <laughs> melt. I'd be no good. Well, the only thing that gave me some comfort is that I'm never going to see any of these people no. again. <laughs> yeah. I was like one of five Australians going to an all Indian wedding. Yeah. It was in like the rural part of Kerala. So it's like proper third world, you know, outback India. Yeah. Half of these people have never outback. seen <laughs> half of these people never seen a, a Westerner before. Yeah. And so I was like, you know what, let's let's just go with it, see what happens and uh it's, yeah, come home. <laughs> it's a good attitude to have that I'll never see these people again, so nothing matters. Uh, and it, yeah, so I, I do, I, I commend you for, for jumping on that. It, it is, uh, it was quite impressive watching that. Mm. Um, but it is good to be back because, wow, uh, we've got a big year ahead. Um, we've changed the podcast slightly. There's a couple of extra little segments sprinkled in now. Uh, you would have heard some new music at the start there. We thought we'd, we'd freshen up the podcast. It's, it was fantastic. We love Win the Day, our first uh, initial <laughs> podcast jingle at the start. <laughs> yeah. But like all good things, the time comes to freshen them up. And we've, we've done that. We've retired year. the intro. <laughs> we've retired the intro. You can find that song, I'm sure, out there on the internet. 
Uh, but it's time to, to freshen out the pod, which is super exciting. Just, just so, plug, plug it into all good royalty-free music stores. <laughs> yeah, you can see it on any sort of real cheap ad out there. Uh, we've started seeing it on TV out there sometimes, a few jingles. So obviously the budget for those ads are a little lower uh, than they would have hoped, but that's okay. But um, mm. we are back. We are very excited to be back. Um, there are some exceptional guests in the pipeline this year. So uh, so strap in. Uh, it's going to be another great year of the Sports Show podcast. So let's get cracking, mate. Um, if you haven't already, follow us on LinkedIn. And if you want to connect with us and 500 others now in the Sports Show community, become a member of that community. It's fantastic. We're on Discord. Uh, you can join hundreds of people in there and connect with them super easy. So uh, what is happening in our community at the moment? Because it's going off. Oh, Ryan, plenty is happening at the moment. Most recently, we had our three meetups in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane. You can even go further back mm. to Mumbai a couple of weeks ago where yeah. uh, I was over there hosting two meetups, one on a Friday night, the next one on a Saturday morning. It was just back-to-back meetups. International meetups. Back-to-back international huge. meetups, which was huge, yep. Uh, our job count just ticked over 300 jobs. So our members have gone and grabbed over 300 jobs in the sports industry, which is absolutely phenomenal. One of our most recent superstars in the community, her name is Tanisha Rao, and she has just been talking about racing and motorsport ever mm. since we met her. And um, during her time being a member, she she reached out to Cricket Australia to volunteer at the Gabba Test yes, match. Yes, I remember this. Just to get a bit of work experience, which then helped her with her next interview at T8 Race Engineering, where she got the job as a commercial coordinator, which she said, this is like one of my top two mm. dream workplaces. So she's over there working in the V8. So well done to you, Tanisha. Another one to call out, Daniel Morris. Who Legend. Got, who got a job at the Sydney meetup, not yep. the recent one, but the one back in November. He uh, went up and chatted to Claire Stewart Hunter, one of our panellists. She uh, is one of the senior executives at Gemba. And by having that relationship with Claire, uh, he was able to hit it off straight away when he applied for an account manager role at Gemba. She was the interviewer. He's now got the job. So well done to you, Dan. And uh, this one's just come in quite recently, Jack Dobson. And I've got to read out the message that he's posted in the Winds channel as well. He says, this is Jack. Sports grad is truly magic. <laughs> Legend. We love that. Yeah, Good we start. love that. Good little sell for us. <laughs> yep. Uh, within a couple of days of becoming a member last month, I had received two phone calls about organizing interviews. The first within a matter of hours of joining. And in a week from now, I start my new position as communications and events coordinator for Hockey ACT. I've been trying to get a sports industry job in the ACT for a while now. So a massive shout out to the team here. That can't be a coincidence. So excited. Well done to you, Jack. We love that. On you, uh, Jackie D. Absolute yep. legend. So if you have had a job recently and you're a member, chuck it in the Wins channel. We'd love to give you a shout out. But we've also got another new announcement. Mm. We have just opened a brand new job board last week. Yes. And so if you want to check it out, there's a link in our show notes to head uh, to go straight there. Or if you head to our website as well, you'll be able to find uh, that on there too. But we've got some great jobs from the Broncos are up there. Uh, the MCC is up there. Unisport Australia is up there. Venues Cric- live. Venues awesome. live. So um, go through and check out those jobs. Um, that is starting to become a really cool place where you can go and find new jobs in sport. Yeah. Uh, we mentioned some of our meetups recently. We'll keep you posted when the next ones are happening. But every week in the community, we run uh, Zoom events. So this Wednesday, we've got a, a new event called Ask Sports Grad, where you can jump on, have a QA and a with Ryan and myself. And uh, at the end of this show, actually, we are going to be answering one of them on the show. If you want to hear it live and you want the full extent of questions and you want to ask your own questions, make sure you become a member and join us on Wednesday night. We'll be plucking one out to, to answer in this segment as well. This also means that this is going to take the, rep- take the place of our bite-sized episode. So Another retiree of the new podcast. Another retri- retiree. <laughs> so the bite-sized tips, a lot of that information and advice is going to come out in the Q&A. So if you want that short, sharp information um, and specific to you now, like we were just kind of you know pulling bits yeah. of information out here and there. But if you want it specific to you, then um, join Ask Sports Crowd next Wednesday. 
We know there's a lot going on, so we've also started a newsletter. If you want to hear exactly what's going on in terms of job openings, networking events, Q&As, latest podcasts, then subscribe to our newsletter. Head to www.com, uh, sorry, www.sportsgrad.com. It's been a while. Has been a while. Dot au forward slash newsletter to subscribe. There's also a link in our show notes to join there. So lots happening. There's get lots on happening. The, get on the newsletter. That'll keep you up to date. I might say as well, you, when you become a member now, you're part of our new talent pool as well. So part of this new job board is that organizations can post their jobs, but also with a click of a button, access our members who are looking for jobs at the moment. So if you want to be front and centre, if you want the biggest organisations to be able to see you and, and what you've done in your career and why they should hire you, become a member because you can be part of that talent pool as well. It is just announcements galore today. Yeah, I feel like we just announced like 15 things in one go. Yeah, but new year, a lot of new stuff. <laughs> new year, we have to get it off our chest now yep. so we can, then we just stick to podcasting. But there is a lot happening, uh, so get involved um, and we, we're excited. So it's going to be a good year. All righty, let's grab a pen. Enjoy this chat with Shane Leonage. Before we jump into the episode, we've got a quick message from our good friends at Deakin University. Deakin has been a huge supporter of sports grad since day one. If you're currently studying or you've just finished studying, having a postgrad qualification in sports management on your resume can give you a huge leg up over other potential candidates applying for that same role. So if you want to pump up your resume and get specialized knowledge in sports behavior, law, marketing, ethics, finance, governance, and strategy, take a look at Deakin's postgrad qualifications. Their Master of Business in Sports Management is not one of, but the best one in Australia, ranked at number one. So add a postgrad to your resume, and that's our tip for the episode. Shane, welcome to the Sportsgrad podcast. No, thanks for having me on, boys. Shane's pleasure to have you in here. I think the last time that we connected with you, it was back at 128, the uh, second office of Cricket Australia, where you were part of the community cricket team. Now you are a Grand Slam winning analyst. W- what's it like? Are you jumping in the Yarrow River? How have you been celebrating <laughs> last week? I was born and raised in Melbourne. I know very well not to jump in the Yarrow. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, look, it's been, uh, I guess, a whirlwind um, since, since our time at community cricket. Um, uh, yeah, look, uh, ve- very happy, obviously. Um, I didn't hit a ball, so <laughs> congratulations need to go to Arena and uh, in particular the coach, the physio and everyone else that's involved. Um, but, yeah, very, very happy. And uh, funnily enough, the tour keeps going, so we've got to week- <laughs> work this week. I was going to say, you, pr- you probably had two of the most hectic weeks, Grand Slam tennis, like, you know, two weeks straight tennis, and now you just got to keep rolling with it. There's no real downside. You know, there's there's no rest. Exactly. The the the, the season is jam packed. The schedule. You've got ATP events, uh, challenger events going on this week. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, you can have a I guess a day to breathe and uh, enjoy the victory. But uh, you've got to, uh, to to work with all your other clients and uh, help them sort of achieve what they can this week as well. Very nice. Now, Shane, we uh, we actually have a new segment on this podcast, which is massive for us. We don't do a lot of sort of segmenty type things on this podcast, but we brought one in this year called Quick Fire Questions. And it's a way for us to connect with our guests and sort of understand some of those little things that, you know, make you tick. Um, so we're very excited about this segment. Uh, I'm not sure how we created it. It seems pretty simple, but we think it's a, a bit of a cracker. So way this is going to work, we're just going to fire questions at you. You'll have some great answers to them. And then we'll uh, we'll find out a little bit more about you. So Ruse will kick it off. Jeez, I'm a bit nervous. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm nervous too. We've yeah. done 220 episodes and not really changed a thing. So this is this is big for us too. We've never had like a segment. Yeah, like, <laughs> this is serious. Yeah, if anyone wants to sponsor it, let us know. Yeah, looking for them. <laughs> Great. After you, mate. All right. First one, Shane. What was your first ever job? Um, yeah, well, I'm actually the first ever job was probably from my mum uh, picking weeds for one cent per weed, but a real job, I guess, uh, paralegal uh, whilst I was at uni um, at Norton Rose. Nice. Uh, favourite sporting moment? I have a few, um, but I think Steve Waugh's 100 off the last ball was one that I, I really enjoyed. Nice. That was incredible. Uh, what is your favourite interview question to ask of candidates? Um I've got a few, but one that I uh, I think I've been using a little bit more is if you didn't get the job now in twelve months' time, I guess from now to twelve months' time, what would you do if you could do the interview again? 
Mm. Yeah, it's a good one. I like that. No, deep. I like it too. Yeah, mm. very deep. We like that. <laughs> um, what's a, a book or a podcast that's helped you at work? I actually brought it in. Um, not sure if it's on camera, but uh, and I'm not affiliated with these guys at all, but <laughs> the decision book, uh, 50 Models for Strategic Thinking. Um, nice. I, I guess in my role, you have access to a lot of information. Um, so it's, it's, I guess, using that information to make decisions. It's really hard sometimes. You've got too much information. So, uh, yeah, this book has really helped um, my thinking uh, around that. I've um, got that book at home. It's a, it's a great read. Is there a particular model that... Uh, stands out to you? Yeah, it's the uh, it's the one I forgot the name, but it's the one where you've got either too little information or um, too much information, and and you want to try and do enough work so you've got enough options, but not too many options. So yeah, that's that's a model that I nice, like. yeah. very good. Uh, are you associated with any grassroots sporting clubs? Um, yeah, so I gr- grew up playing tennis at Mayfield Park Tennis Club, which is in Mount Waverley. Um, and then in Canberra, I played a bit of tennis at uh, Lynham National Sports Club. Um, so they're probably the two that I'm a little bit connected to. Um, yeah. Nice. And finally, mate, uh, if you had 30 minutes to pick anyone's brain, who would it be? Um, look, Jeff Bezos. Um, and uh, the reason is he had a career change. So he was a computer scientist, um, or a data person. Um, and then he decided to sort of go off and go into e-commerce. And I thought that was a big career change for mm. someone that's uh, doing quite well in his other roles. And, um, yeah, and he's obviously been very successful. So, yeah. Amazing. Um, he's made a little bit of money as well. Which yeah, is <laughs> Uh, that'd be, uh, it's always good to, <laughs> yeah, to do yeah. that. Done a ride in e-commerce. Yeah, he's done okay. <laughs> done okay. Mm. Well, I think you've, uh, you've set the bar high for yeah. the quick fire questions around and with your own prop as well. That is, um, <laughs> that is outstanding commitment to the, the QFQs. Yeah, we've set the standard high. Good start. Yeah. Um, now, Shane, we've got you in here because you are now a Grand Slam winning analyst with Team Sabalenka. But as you mentioned you weren't always working in performance analytics. You started out as a paralegal, which is entirely different. I can imagine the the environment at work is just polar opposites. Um, so tell us a bit about your career journey to the job you're in now. Yeah, so at, at university, I studied commerce and law. Um, and I think we were having a conversation just before ju- jumping in here. And, and you're 17, 18 at that time when you're you're deciding on what you want to do. Um, so commerce and law, with the marks I had, I thought, okay, that's a good profession. Everyone says you're going to have a stable job at the end. Uh, you go through uni um, and you, you come out and, yeah, and I realised like with law you needed to do some further study to do enough hours, do a, a grad uh, diploma to be able to be admitted, to be able to be a lawyer. So you, you do that and then you start working and uh, and it's not that I didn't enjoy it. I think there were elements of the role that I, I really did like and um, but a couple of years in, I thought, no, it's not not really for me. Um, and I didn't want to shift drastically. So at the time, uh, I moved away from private law into government law, um, into the appropriations team at the time in, in the Commonwealth. Um, and yes, yeah, slowly over time, I think it, the role um, changed from being a legal role. And I started using a bit more of my commerce accounting background. Um, and, and went into the financial side of, uh, of government. Um, and, yeah, and I sort of did that for a while. And uh, along the way, I think uh, data became a, a bigger and bigger um, part of that role. Uh, so I had to upskill myself, um, did some certifications at the time, um, and then I transitioned more into sort of data and uh, analytical roles along the way. Um, uh, and, yeah, and then uh, I think it was about 2016 or 17. Um, I was at a point where uh, I, I was sort of passionate about sport um, and really thought there was an opportunity to start using data in sport a little bit more. Um, uh, and I started almost uh, just a, a little bit of a side project, uh, data-driven sports analytics. Um, uh, went out with a couple of mates that were coaches uh, to regional tournaments and helped them sort of collect data from there and then uh, give them some insight from from the matches of their, of their students and... Um, and yeah, and then that's how it started. At the same time, I think a role at Cricket Australia came up um, and I thought, okay, it's a bit of a risk. It's a bit of a, uh, a career, some would say, going backwards a little bit in your career, but I thought, no, I had to get some credibility. I needed to work in an organisation that's reputed. Um, so I went into Cricket Australia and, and yeah, uh, sort of did that at the same time as my data-driven sports analytics uh, side project. And uh, I think COVID hit. Um, and when COVID hit, uh, um, I just... 
it, it, I think I got, had some clarity on what I really mm. wanted to do. And, I, and as much as I enjoyed the role of cricket, I thought I need to go all in with data-driven sports analytics. And at the time, I had some good clients um, that committed to me for a longer period of time. So, yeah, it just gave me the – that was a catalyst, I guess, for me to go all in. Nice. Amazing. Yeah. It's good to meet another COVID baby. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And what, what are you trying to achieve at the moment through your business? Is it sort of try and just keep sort of gathering contracts and, and players and whatnot or, or sort of is there something else that you're trying to achieve through it? Yeah, so I think uh, I guess our main goal is to, to try and um, help and educate not just the players, the coaches in the teams on how – um, they can improve the performance of the athlete uh, using this sort of data, and that's data from matches, so using things like Hawkeye data, but using GPS trackers and, and so to optimise their training as well as their match performance. So um, that's, 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 I guess, our goal, uh, what we, we want to do. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, for us in the organisation, we want to, to do that with as many players as we can, talk to federations and, mm. and, and help federations also improve the analytical sort of programs that they have. So, so do you have like your own sort of specific system that you will use to analyse a match or, or a training and are you trying to replicate that in other analysts underneath you to work with more clients? So it's like this is the, you know, Shane's way of analysing data. Yeah, a, li- a little bit. So we've, um, we've built um, some... I would say systems based on various data sources and and they'll spit out reports um, or dashboards that the analysts can use. Uh, I still think there's an element of, uh, you know, I'll interpret something a certain way and I'm not necessarily right. So it does take whoever's in my team, I, I encourage them to, if they see a pattern and they go, look, to open up the, the backhand, you need to go via the forehand on this occasion. And I might see it differently, and I, but I'll still encourage them, as long as they're using the data and it's based in fact, um, I'm okay with them interpreting it a different way. Um, of course, we've got the systems to hopefully give you enough information to, to be able to make those decisions. And, and like, what what are some of the key stats in tennis that you're you're looking for? Yeah, so um, I guess um, yeah, the court position uh, where where players are making contact with the ball. Um, I a bit of my research actually, um, and I'll plug the Masters of Sports Analytics program. But the, the final um, research piece that I did there was shot sequences to, um, to, to look at what shot sequences are better for certain types of players. Um, so, uh, yeah, for me, it's probably one of the m- more critical bits of information that a player knows which shot to hit from which court position uh, and against which opponent type. So a certain combination from inside the baseline on, uh, on the ad side um, might be great against Novak Djokovic but might be a really poor sort of decision against Rafael Nadal. So to, to be able to use data, um, to you know, so, so you use things like spin, speed, uh, where the opponent's standing at the time that you're making contact, so that sort of information to be, uh, yeah. So I think that's probably one of the more important bits of information. And when you say combination, do you mean like if I receive it wide on the back end side, it's best for me to go down the line, down the line, cross court or something like that? Yeah, yeah to, to the combination. So, you, uh, so I, when, when I talk about sequences, I'm usually talking about two shots in a row. So it could be forehand cross, a forehand line. Mm. So I'm always encouraging my teams to think a shot ahead. What, what's the shot you want next? Um, and if you can execute those two shots, um, in tennis, rallies are generally under five or six shots. Like the majority of them are under that. So if you can get two shots in a row that you want, you're, you, on your own terms, uh, we expect you to finish the point. Yeah. Mm. You like creating the game that they're playing. Like when you watch, when I watch tennis, by no means am I thinking they're literally trying to strategize the exact point they're going to put the ball. It's kind of like, well, the way we see it is like they're just reacting to where the ball goes and they'll hit, you know, the easiest way they can get it back over. But it sounds like you're literally creating a game plan for them essentially and the coach just kind of helps with the, the skill side of things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think some players are reactive. Uh, no matter how much of this you pump in and, <laughs> uh, and training, that they, not, they're they going to be on instinct. And, and, and to an extent, what we're doing as well. So with Arena, for instance, the last three years, we've practiced patterns that are good for her. But on, on match day, she's probably not thinking, oh, I need to hit this combination and that combination. It's just instinctive because we've done it so many times so she's like mm. the ball's here she'll play that and she'll play that she's not even thinking but she's playing the right pattern because uh i guess we've yeah. practiced that and uh and it's something you know the coach bought into and and yeah how um 
What is that relationship like with the coach? Is that sometimes a bit of a tension point? Because I'd imagine, you know, you, you might have different ideas about what they need to do. And are there any sort of examples about how you've navigated that tension? Yeah, um, I think... Uh, I think we're different, and and uh, and I guess uh, I can't speak for all, all sort of arrangements, but most arrangements, I think the coach is bringing you in because you're bringing in a different set of eyes. Yeah, uh, they're, they're not bringing another coach, so I think they respect that I'm going to look at the game differently, and I'm going to bring different things. Um, I, for me, one of the big things is I play to the team, so I guess the coach probably has the vision for the team, and my role is to play a role within that vision. So. I'd say 99% of the communications, particularly Arena's team, is with the coach. We'll discuss things. We might not agree on everything, mm. but if we're going out there and we're all sitting there and talking and Arena's asking about the game plan, I'm not going to go in there and, and say something different because we, we want to have an agreement. But uh, I think we've, got, we've had robust conversations on, on certain topics and, um, and, and I think there's, there's that respect that I won't, just, I won't be a yes man. Um, I'll, if, I, if I think that's an incorrect pattern or that's – the wrong way to go about something. Um, I'll tell him. We'll have a conversation, and then um, you know there'll be an outcome. And, and uh, yeah, but at the end of the day, we, we'll, we'll be aligned whenever we, we're talking to the athlete. Yeah, nice, fascinating stuff. Like I had no idea um, how much went into tennis. Um, I think I saw a highlight of a sixty uh, uh, shot rally sometime in this yep. tournament. Does that all get thrown out of the window, the work that you do when it gets to that point? Yeah, look, at, at some stage, yeah, it's just like you're trying to survive in that point and tr- trying, to, trying to end it. Um, yeah, look, I, I think, um, and I'm probably um, g- going to get a black mark with my da- data brethren here, but, uh, you know, at some point, data doesn't, like, you, you can't, it, data plays a little role in certain things, but it's not everything. So, yes, when you get it to a 60-shot rally, uh, you know, you both probably very tired uh, and trying to end the point. So you're not thinking clearly. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's certainly something in my data set when I see that, I probably exclude looking at it because it's, it's such an outlier. So what if you if you had um, a day of work on your terms, what, what would the perfect day look like in your world? <laughs> I probably haven't had a, a good think about that. Um, yeah, it would be uh, um, we know who the opponent is early uh, early enough, and I say that because often um, I'm based in Melbourne, the players are playing somewhere on the other side of the world and the websites are not updated very quickly. Players are not the most attentive to, to knowing who they're playing in the draw, so we, there's a, usually a, a big struggle to find out who they're playing. Um, and then Grand Slams are good because you've got that day off between, between when the players play, but most tournaments they play in the next day, so... Anyway, going back to the good day is I'll know who the opponent is very early um, and that, that way my team can source the videos required to, to do the video analysis um, and then we'll pull the relevant data, get the report out in time, have a good conversation with the coach, we're in agreement um, and then um, if I'm there, we're at the match um, or if I'm tuning in from Melbourne, I can just watch the match nice and calm and the player wins in straight sets and, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're good. Get to bed early. It's not 4 a.m. Yeah, when the yeah. game ends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't have to take a tough call with the coach uh, yeah. and, yeah, that's a good day. How much do you look at, um, uh, like, opposition vision and data? And so I'm guessing, like, you know, if you're waiting to receive information about who they're playing and who's coming up, are you staying up all hours of the night to get this ready for the next day? Yeah, the first thing I mentioned, I, I mean, I have a, a small team now, so it's um, it's not necessarily me um, d- doing all of that all the time. Um, but we, uh, I guess our analysis probably f- falls into three buckets. So when you're in a tournament, your focus is primarily on the opponent. Um, when you're leading up to the tournament, the focus is a little bit more on your player and what they need to do to win the tournament. And then you go into preseason, the focus is 100% on the player. Uh, but yeah, in tournament, we look at the draw and we'll look at a round ahead. So we're, we know who they're playing next round and then we're ready for either opponent in the next round. So we'll have the video sourced by, by that point. Um, and then it's just a matter of once we know who it is, uh, um, our team to pull the data from the various dashboards. Um, we've got a, a coach that also pri- provides coaching context. So they'll have a bit of a look at the vision and, and provide some narrative around um, the opponent. But yeah, that's... That's how we do it. We try and be as prepared as we can um, around ahead. And when you're looking at the opponent, what sort of stuff are you looking for? Yeah, I think um, 
someone coined this term, and I can't remember. Like it's an 80-20 um, sort of uh, look at – so 80% you're still looking at your player's strengths. So if your player has a big forehand, big serve, um, that's you're, you're still centering your game plans around that. Um, and then you look at the opponent and you're like, okay, right, they've also got a big forehand. So how do we use our forehand but prevent them – using their forehand. So, you, 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 yeah, your player's strengths, but you marry it up to your opponent's weaknesses as well. Mm. Wow. Do you share with your players, like, you know, when they enter a tie break, um, I feel like that is sh- quite strategic because there's a certain number of serves. It's not like a regular game. Do you sort of share with them some of the, like, percentage shots, for instance, so that, you know, when they're in that super pressure cooker situation, they can go to those percentages yeah absolutely so uh so it's probably one of the the big things that we we look at and what we can influence um uh, so we look at not just tie breaks pressure points yeah so when when the opponent steps up on a break point yeah. what are their preferences um what what are the patterns that they really want to play yeah. um so and 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 yeah that, that's something we, we definitely look at um this australian open so part of my other role i'm working at tennis australia and we developed a live um, a tablet that goes to the coaches um, with, with data, and w- one of the views is that serve view. So, um, so yeah, the coaches could, and because there's on court coaching now, they yep. could communicate that. And and I was in the box with a few players where we were like, okay, it's the ad side, it's a break point. They've gone eighty percent here. Just cover that. If they ace you the other way, fine, but to take away their best yep. uh, or most preferred option. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it w- worked a few times. Sometimes it goes the <laughs> other way, but. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think. How has um how has that on court coaching changed your role? Because it's super new, right? Was it? Yeah. It's only last year that that came in. So a couple of years ago, the WTA, so the women's tour, they trialed it and they had it on there. Um, and then the Davis Cup and team competitions have had sort of a coach sort of there on the on the yeah. on the bench. But yeah, the Grand Slams and the ATP tour trialed it from the US Open last year. And it's still a trial, but they extended it um, to this year, and mm. and yeah, so it's new. I think it's, I think it's it's really good. It's it's enhanced, I would say, the analyst role. Yeah. Um. So while I was sitting in there with with various teams with a tablet with the data coming in. The coach doesn't really want to look at the tablet. They want to be emotionally connected to the player, um, yeah. and, and the player probably wants them watching rather than looking at a tablet. So, but then the coach can ask me and go, what's going on here? What's going on there? Similar to AFL. You've got analysts sort of sitting in the box. Yeah. I'm sure the coaches are like, what's going on with the, the defensive line or, or something like that? And yeah. um, I think that's where it's going to go further. In yeah, because it's kind of changed, you know, your role in that you have to kind of provide live updates now, whereas yeah. before it was probably more like – post-match analysis and and pre-game preparation, you know? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Although, um, I don't know if I should admit this, but um, (laughs) coaches used to text me during matches um, (laughs) (laughs) noting that I'm watching and I've probably got data going in there. uh, Even before the the trial was there, they'd they'd text and ask. Um, It's just, yeah, I, I think it's just brought... Um, something that was happening on, on tennis anyway, that was on-court coaching happening. Yep. Now that it's allowed, um, yeah, it's great to have d- data in there and um, and I think it'll only grow um, mm. over time. Yeah. yeah. So are you like watching tennis matches going, I know it's going to happen here, I've seen all the data, <laughs> they're going to go wide, there it is, I told you. <laughs> yeah, I, to be honest, I don't enjoy watching tennis anymore, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's never like that. I think, um, yeah, you, you, you can have... Uh, a good idea of what's going to happen next, but um, the the really good players they can change up a pattern, um, and, I, and I always say that when we go out and we give a scouting report, great. This you know this is how it's based on historical data and what we think they're going to do. But um, if what you're doing is working really well, expect the opponent, the really good opponents, mm-hmm. to go. Okay, they're doing this. Yeah. We need to change it. To, so you need to have a game plan A, B, C. Yeah. So so with your analytics point of view, I just want to ask about your perspective on Novak Djokovic and why you think he's amazing. Yeah, I mean, he, uh, he, he's probably the hardest player to break down because um, going back seven, eight years, on the forehand side, there was a weakness. There was definitely a weakness. And, and uh, if I was doing this role seven, eight years ago, uh, we would have tried to play most of the game there. He's actually improved that side significantly. I think he's got the greatest backhand of all time. It's, 
you go there and you play three balls in a row there, you've, you've lost the point. Like, I, <laughs> it's just, um, uh, and then he's improved his serve. I just think he's technically the hardest player to, to break down. Um, and then he's unbelievable in terms of his movement. He's sliding. Like, he times his slide onto his shots better than anyone in, in the game before him. Um, so, yeah, he's, and, yeah, on a hard court, um, and probably getting technically uh, here uh, in night conditions where it's cooler, the ball's a bit slower, it's just perfect for him. Um, and re- really the only place where I think someone better than him is Nadal on clay. Um, other than that, I think on any other surface, Novak is the, is the greatest. Mm. Yep. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, your role sounds very glamorous. You watch a lot of tennis. You're hanging out with superstars of the game. Talk to us about some of the not-so-sexy parts of performance analytics. Um. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, and this is probably the same for most data roles, there's data cleaning. So the data that we get in from Hawkeye or the data that we even manually tag, uh, usually there's there's some errors in there. So you've got to clean that up. Um, so that's not very glamorous. Uh, Does that literally mean like going into an Excel cell and changing the number? Yeah, so we, we would do it uh, using Python, um, but we, we, we'd look for errors. I mean, we've got some, um, some tools that we've set up to look at things that look wrong and it'll flag, give us a, a, almost a traffic light system going, you better check this data, it doesn't look quite right. So we do have some things, but sometimes it is a matter of just going into the source sheet and going, that doesn't look right. Looking at the video and go, hmm, it says it's a volley, but I'm watching the video, it's a forehand. So it, it's f- fixing yeah. it up that way. Um, and the other stuff is, yes, Grand Slams are glamorous, but we've got players at the moment playing um, events, 15K events um, in the middle of nowhere somewhere. Um, so yeah, there's at the other end of the spectrum, but mm. you, you've got to, um, sort of help clients in, in, in that, that area as well. Is that, is that a bit of a challenge for you? You, you got Sabalenka here, he's just won a grand slam. You've got some up and comers who are, you know, trying to get to that point, but you've kind of got to give them somewhat the same love. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, a hundred percent. And, and I, I think. Uh, I think my team does pride itself. Like we, we had two players going through qualifications in, uh, and getting into main draw. And that was, um, and I sa- uh, say it honestly as well, that, that gave me as much joy really because that they're just set up, uh, and I can't remember what the round one prize money was, 100,000 or 90,000, but that's just set them up um, um, to, to be able to invest in stuff like what we're doing, but also travel with a coach, which they wouldn't have done otherwise. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we obviously, the Zabalenkas pay for a premium package. Uh, some of those players pay for um, a much more sort of standard or baseline yeah. sort of package. So th- they'll, we, we'll provide the service uh, to that package, but uh, I'd like to think we we have the same passion um, to, to help them as much as the, the Zabalenkas of the world. Mm. Yeah. Just not every tournament has got a Canadian club tent to go hang out <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but <laughs> that's what we were thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's the only downside. Yeah, of course. Um, let, let's talk about habits at work because of all the um, people I've met in sport, it's the analytics folk who tend to be the most savvy, the most productive, the most organised. So I'm interested to hear what are some of your work habits, Shane? Jeez, I never heard this before. <laughs> <laughs> Just an observation of mine. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, sorry, go back to the question. I <laughs> uh, w- work habits. What are the things that you yeah. do daily that help you be productive and work well? Yeah, I, I actually like um, start maybe the night before. I like to have a, a list of, I guess, what I want to tackle um, the, the next day. And, and I guess with my role, when I wake up, things could have changed significantly. So I'll re- revisit that list and then prioritise and, and then sort of go from there. And I think that's helped Um because sometimes there's chaos, particularly at a start of a tournament, you've got 12 players, then you've got some data issues coming from Hawkeye, you've got data issues on your own systems, and then you're like, what do I go? F- where do I go first? If I've done a little bit of that thinking the night before um, and done some of that thinking on the morning, then I can at least go in with a bit of clarity. Um, mm. And I think that's something that I've done um, in previous roles as well. Um, that That's helped me. I think that the, when, when I've done it, I've uh, the day has been a lot better than when I haven't done it. Yeah. Is there a, is there a page in the decision book on prioritization <laughs> and what things should be done first? I think there, there there's a model in there. I can't, yeah. can't remember. It's been, been a while since. I, I reckon I actually might have. I'm, I'm answering my own question here. Um, <laughs> I might have it earmarked in the book I have, but it's like the urgent and important yes. graphs. Like yep. what is urgent and important? What is not urgent, not important? Yes. What's 
not urgent one. but important. It's like that Q2 that you want to be spending most of your time exactly. in. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Should have done a live yeah. reading. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We are this uh, Mikhail Krogus and Roman uh, Shuffler. They Should, need to be. Show uh, the camera. We'll, we'll put it right up there so those watching can have yeah. a look. We've there got the camera is. working now. The decision <laughs> book. <laughs> yep. All right. I think these two need to be paying us some royalties. <laughs> yeah, they do. They do. We'll get in touch with their team. And they'd be listening anyway, so we'll, um, we'll get in touch. Um, to, back to your sort of role specifically, is it, you know, from an outside, we might think it's a lot around Excel functions and, and knowing that to a T, and they're very hard to figure out from someone who isn't very analytical. But is that kind of the biggest chunk of it, knowing that side of things, or is there more to, to being an analyst as well? Yeah, I think there's, um, I mean, with the, the analysis side, the coding's necessary, so Python, um, to be able to, so there's a lot of different data sources, and I apologize if I get sort of technical, but there's JSON files, which are sort of Java files, um, and, and and you need to write code to be able to turn that into like a, a CSV um, that go, goes into one of our other systems. So the coding is really important. Um, then the data visualization side. So yes, you've got all this data, but you need to be able to present it so a non-technical mm. audience can look at it and go, I know what's going on here. Yeah. Um, and then I think the soft skills are probably something that I've had to, to learn a lot, just the communication, knowing when to communicate something, um, when to hold back or when, uh, that sort of timing. And then, um, and yeah, just uh, that understand who your audience is. Um, so like the Zabalenka team, the coach is very different to, I work with Ons Jabur, um, the coach is very different, different life experiences, different ways that they approach the world. Um, just how I communicate to them is different to, to Zabalenka's, to different to when I work with Tennis Australia. So yeah, that's mm. uh, the soft skills. I think for any analyst listening uh, or data scientist listening, work on the soft skills, work on presenting the work you're doing, because if you don't do that, you probably devalue what you, you've done. Is uh, communication covered in that book too? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably all in here. Man. Everything's in there. Yeah. <laughs> There's a big thing on this book today. I'll yeah, <laughs> definitely put it in the show notes. Well, that's that's why I love yeah. analysts because they're, they're so logical about things. Everything has yeah. probably already been thought of. Let's just follow the framework. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. Um, awesome. And you mentioned a couple of, of um, things you're working like coding Python. What, what what are some of the tools and platforms that you're playing around with? Yeah, so P Python's probably the, the main one uh, that we're using for, for the coding side. Um, used a little bit of R in the past as well, and, um, and I like to think they're probably interchangeable, um, but I know speaking to a lot of analysts, they'll be either way. Uh, and then for visualization, um, you can do the visualization in, in Python or R, but I, I've um, worked with Tableau and Power BI. So Cricket, we use Power BI, um, Cricket Australia, that is. Um, and then... Uh, on the private side, been using a little bit more of Tableau, um, but uh, yeah, that visualization, th those tools, and then um, they're probably the main ones. But then there's, there's other ones. So like for video editing, we use uh, Dartfish um, or CISA, which is a, a tool basically that can cut up the the tennis video and 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 you can draw and show forehand errors, backhand errors, which is a, a great communication tool when you show a coach and go, okay, this is where the contact point should have been, this is where they hit it. So, um, yeah, tools like that, I think. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, it's it's expanding. There's uh, the VR space is growing, so we're we're talking with a couple of companies where um, uh, basically athletes wear wearing VR goggles and and you can show them patterns uh, of play that we wow. think are going to work and they can almost sort of see that without actually being on the court. Um, so, yeah. Wow, well, hey. So that the, um, Dartfish, is that the sort of platform where you'd show like maps of the court and heat of where more balls are going, that it, sort of thing? It's it's actually um, a, a video editing software mm. um, and it's – so our coders will get the raw video um, and then they will uh, lo uh, load it into Dartfish. And on Dartfish, they will go in and tag or tag a point, annotate a point mm. and say, that was a forehand mistake. Um, and then uh, and we'll do that for the whole match. And then the, the coach who watch it later on can just get the video and, and they can go, okay, I just want to see all forehand mistakes. Mm. And they press forehand mistakes and they'll just see the video, of just the forehand mistakes. Um, yep. But Dartfish allows you to do other things like draw on draw on, on, on the actual video and, 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 and you can pause frame and draw and say, okay, that's where you should have been. Or, um, so it's, yeah, it's a video, video editing tool. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I know uh, like we get asked a lot, how do you get into performance analytics? And, um, we encourage people to get out there and just find someone, some things to analyze. 
but I'm wondering if, if if there's platforms like Dartfish and the other ones you mentioned, are these free things that you can download and play around with in your own time? Um, so I think uh, there might be a free version of Dartfish. Obviously, it's limited in what you can do, but um, and there's definitely a trial period uh, with some of them. So I, I do encourage people to to download that and and then have a go. Like if you want, and it's not just tennis. I think you can use Dartfish for hockey, um, a number of different sports are there. So yeah, download it and then maybe get a video from YouTube loaded in and, and just train yourself, um, get get comfortable with it. There's plenty of YouTube videos, I think, out there to to, to learn if you want to. And, and I know Dartfish have their own channel as well. So, um, yeah, if you're interested, certainly do that. Um, the, the other thing I recommend, there's, there's a lot of um, courses now as well, the performance analytics courses. So ha- have a look at that um, because you do get – the, not only the technical skills you need, but the soft skills um, um, to, to, to actually thrive in, in, in the industry. Have you done a lot of that self-learning for all these platforms? Because you listed them off there, I'm like, holy moly, you're going to have to learn a few platforms. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I think I started most of them self-learning, but you get to a point where, okay, you know enough, but you want to go to the next step. So Python, for instance, I started self-taught and then I did the Masters of Sports Analytics program and you're just... Uh, thrown in there to do you know all your projects so that um, the industry research component of it needs you to be able to to do that so that took my I guess Python skills to another level um, with uh, with like Dartfish uh, again part of that course there was a I think I had to do something with rugby um, so again you got a practical experience um, with real um, I guess real professionals at the other side looking at your work to critique um, so again, it, it forced me to learn those tools to a, to a different extent. Um, but yeah, yeah, you, I, I think uh, a <laughs> long answer is you can get to a certain level, but yeah. then uh, if you want to go further, then there are sort of private sort of study methods that you should probably look at. Yeah, mm. awesome. We, there was one guy in our community, uh, Dixon Chung, I think his name was, yeah. but he was playing around with Python or one of the other platforms and analyzing AFL data. And... Um, this might have been during COVID too, but he'd, he'd analyze the data, get this visualization and post it on LinkedIn and um, did that for a few weeks. And then within like a month, I think it was Huddle contacted him and said, hey, do you want a job? Yeah. <laughs> um, I noticed you've put out a whole lot of stuff on LinkedIn as well. Has, has anything come from that or just interesting conversations? Um, yeah, look, actually the first, the, the first tennis coach that reached out to me was through, I think I did an analysis um, and just put something up on Instagram May have been on LinkedIn as well, I can't recall, but he saw it on Instagram. He reached out and he said, look, I have a player who's ranked 140 in the world. I like what you did. Could you do something similar for, for the player? And I thought I thought he was having me on the first time. And I, <laughs> I, I was like, who is this guy, this Italian guy halfway across the world? Um, but yeah, it, it came out of that. And then I got to work with a, a player, the, the first player that was sort of on the ATP tour. Um, and so something came out, so I, I can't, yeah, I, I can't encourage people enough to, to put yourself out there, do some analysis, play with the tools. You'll get, not only will you get better, but other people will recognise and, and the skill set is something that people do want in the sports, yeah. So Instagram got you your first professional tennis player. That is yeah. unreal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is so cool. Yeah. Um, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's not the normal way to get a job, I think. Yeah. It's, be- it's becoming the normal way, I think. Yeah. yeah. You don't need to be posting. You can post on LinkedIn, great, but use all the platforms. Yeah. <laughs> There's opportunities. Absolutely. <laughs> nice. Uh, all right, Shane, final question. We love this question. Uh, if you were to leave a note for yourself or a student out there who wants to get into performance analytics, what would that note say? Um, uh, look... For everyone, I encourage them to sort of volunteer and put themselves out there. Um, so, you know, you might apply for roles and not necessarily get it straight away. But um, I, like I said, I went around with a tennis coach um, and I, I wasn't charging them at all. And it was just so I could see what, what they needed and get a good idea of what the need was. And then I could sort of at a low lower risk um, develop my product and my skill yeah. set um, so that volunteering is 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 a great way you'll make connections um, but you'll also develop yourself and then when the opportunities do come you're ready um, so by the time that I got reached out on Instagram I, I had plenty of um, time playing with the data understanding what I needed to do with the data and how it would help um, so yeah I was able to take that opportunity because I'd done all that sort of voluntary free work 
I hope you don't mind me asking, but how old were you when you started volunteering with these coaches? Um, so I would have been maybe 26, 27. So I'd had yeah. my early part of the career, the legal side, um, and then uh, really wanted to make that career change. Um, and and at that stage, rightfully, no one really looked at, uh, at me. Um, at that point, I didn't have any experience in, in sports. Um, and yes, I had some data experience, but uh, I guess I had no credibility. Um, so the volunteering um, and just honing my skills, that period I did that really helped. Um, so when I did get that opportunity, I, like I, yeah, I, I was able to, um, I guess, succeed at that point. Mm. I think that's really eye-opening for, for people to understand because I think people perhaps look at volunteerism as something you do when you're 18, 19, early in your career, but really it's something that you do when you're early in your experience. doesn't matter if you're mm. 17 or 27 or even 37, like you've got to start off just getting those runs on the board. Yeah, exactly. And, it, and when you, it's not all or nothing, right? It's not like I was volunteering and not having paid employment. I was still mm. working at government, worked at cricket. So I was doing, doing a few things, but I, I made the time to do that because – I saw something could come of it in four or five years' time or w whatever it was. So, um, yeah, volunteering doesn't mean quit your job or anything yeah. like that. It, it just means make the time. If, if you think it's important, um, make the time. And, and look where we are now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love what you said about the, the low risk thing. You know, like you, you can volunteer at your grassroots club. If you get something wrong, like it's not the end of the world. You know, it's a good time to just kind of test your skills and whatnot so yeah and a lot of these grassroots clubs that they, they don't have the analytics no. it, it's it's a it's a nice thing to have um yeah. but they're not going to be super critical that you got you know whether it's cricket you got you know a couple of runs wrong they, yeah they're, they're not going to go and say oh my gosh you know they're not going to give you a bad review on google yeah. or something, right? like, <laughs> it's um we're never having another analyst again yeah, never <laughs> um so yeah absolutely it's um and that's the best place to learn i think yeah no, nice. I think. Um, we're talking a lot about analytics. Any other episodes that we can share that people might be interested in? Well, when you were talking about teaching yourself Python and all these other platforms, you reminded me of a bloke called uh, Binuk Kadidawaku. I'm not sure if you've come across him in your time. He actually had a very similar start to you because he mm. studied a law degree yep. over in Perth. And I think it was in his second year of his law degree, he decided, I don't want to be a lawyer, but persisted with the next five years of study. But during that time, he taught himself all these analytics platforms. And by the end of it, he was able to take these different functions and algorithms to the Adelaide Crows and say, hey, I've got a, you know, a new way of analysing uh, an AFL list. And so he essentially like created his own department, is now the head yeah. of innovation and, and data analytics at the Adelaide Crows. He's now gone over to Duke University to do his PhD in yeah. analytics, I believe. So he's like working in the US, but then also working for the Adelaide Crows at the same time. Flew um, back for the draft. Flew back for the yeah. draft. So, yeah, so he's sitting next to, like, the head of recruitment when the draft's been yeah. going on. So he's a fascinating one. He's episode 148, I think. Um, so he's, like, hardcore, like, analytics in the AFL world. Then there's uh, Libby Owens, who's a CEO of Champion Data, the supplier of all the data for most of the major sports. She's episode 204, I reckon. So she... For those who want a yeah. good overview of what's going on out there, she's a, a good one too. Awesome. Shane, it's uh, it's been great to see you again. Thanks for coming in and uh, listening to what, what you do. It you know can kind of – it's just incredible listening to it, like actually seeing what you do day to day, sort of working with some of the best athletes in the world and sort of understanding what actually goes into providing – all those insights that you give is um, is very, very interesting. So I'm sure a lot of people listening would have uh, really enjoyed today. So thank you very much for coming in and, and good luck for future tournaments. Uh, thanks for having me on, guys. I was a bit worried I might put you both to sleep, but uh, no. at the end of it, you're awake. So. Not at all. It's been eye-opening. <laughs> More awake than I was an hour ago. <laughs> Absolutely. It's thanks, been guys. brilliant. So thank you. Guys, stick around. Uh, coming up is another new segment. And I, I can't believe I'm saying that. Two new segments in the same show. Uh, and it's called Ask Sports Grab. So it's coming up next. It's time now for our newest segment of the Sports Grad podcast, and that is Ask Sports Grad, where every week we answer a question from our community. And if you'd like to ask a question, firstly, become a SportsGrad member at sportsgrad.com.au slash community, and then we will answer your questions that come through. So, Rubes, the first question of the year. 
massively exciting this one i love new segments me too fun. yeah feels fresh so this one came from one of our members at the sports grad meetup last oh, couple of fridays ago now um and this is a question it goes so i'm looking to transition from a community development role to a communications role how should i go about making that career change mm. great question um i think um Kind of reminds me of a lot of people who kind of start their career in a field that they think is right for them. It probably might have been the first opportunity that came for them to get the foot in the door. Yeah. Then they realize it's not quite all that it seemed and they want to start to make it a change. But sometimes yeah. you can feel like you're locked into to one pocket of the sports industry for the rest of your life. Well, um, that's not the case at all. You can bounce around. However, it is harder to transition sideways if you do not have experience in another space so for this person you've got someone who's got a whole heap of experience in community not so much in communication but what's to make that jump across to communications now one way to make that jump is to find time after hours on the weekend or somewhere else within your job if you can you know get your job done and then have a pocket of time where you do something different is to um start what i call a diy internship now this is something that you do purely for the skills or the networks that it gives you as opposed for the the monetary return and these things are great because they come from you it's got to be your idea you've got to drive it and so by taking it on straight away you indicate you're the kind of person who has got initiative if you're going to start yep. a project then that's great because everyone needs projects started in no matter what pocket you're doing so I would think of what is your type of DIY internship that, that you can start. If we're looking at communications um, and, you know, you, you might want to get into uh, writing press releases, uh, that sort of thing, then find a way that you can either shadow the communications department in your yeah. current workplace or perhaps take on the role somewhere else. So, for example, like the um, – the Aussie rules football season is coming up in, in Australia at the moment. There's a whole lot of grassroots clubs that are just about to finish pre-season and start playing the regular season. Mm. One of the things that you could start doing for them is treat them like a professional team and pretend you're the comms manager. Now, obviously, you've got to go and get this opportunity. So you might say something to them along the lines of, hey, um, I'm looking to make a career change into communications um, I'm learning all about what's involved and the different skills. I'm mm. writing a lot. I'm trying to build up my writing, all that sort of thing. However, I would love a project to be able to, to practice on. I see that no one is doing this sort of stuff for you at the moment. Do you mind if I take the opportunity to, to write match reports or write a press release, try and get in the local paper, yeah. that, that sort of thing? Um, and then say you go through the full season of doing that. Now, you can go, now when an opportunity comes up, uh, for a communications job in the future and they ask you, well, when have you done this before? You can say to them, well, I knew this might be a problem for me because I've never had experience in this space before. Mm. However, to try and get that, what I've tried to do is learn about that space and apply it in a grassroots football club to yep. make heroes of these people and make the lives of grassroots volunteers easier. And I think that in itself just speaks volumes of the kind of person you are that you're yeah. willing to go out and learn a new skill find ways to be better at it on your own and then put it to practice and learn and adapt because once you get to that new job they're going to be like wow if this person's on like a learning trajectory that's going sharp mm. upwards like we, we want them in our team um so that's how i would go about it yeah create a diy internship that allows you to get the skills and networks that will help you down the track yeah, I love it. It comes down to being curious, right? Mm. If you're interested in something, find a way to learn about it. Meet some people who do it. You know, mm. I like exactly what you said there. Go and put yourself out there and learn yourself. Mm. You know, I guarantee if you went to a grassroots club and said, hey, I want to do this, I will help you do it. You don't need to do anything. Mm. All, you, all, you, all you need to give me is access to the website so I can post it. But <laughs> I guarantee they won't say no brings publicity to their club as well. So yeah. I think with this, you also have to take a pretty long-term view at it too. Yeah. Like you can't just decide you're going to make a career change into something brand new and expect it to happen next week or even next month. Yeah. Like you've got to think, all right, six months, 12 months down the track. Yeah. Um, one of our members, his name is Jai Lawther, 
He is uh, working in defence at the moment. He's an analyst for the Defence Force, wants to move into sport. When I first met him in July 2022, he said, I want to make a transition into sport in January 2024. So he's thinking 18 months in advance. He's like, I want to become a member so that over the next 18 months I can start to learn more, start to connect the right people and then get ready to make this transition. Yeah. So – you got to be like Jai a bit and Love start that. to have some long-term thinking. Yeah. It's like a full portfolio view. Yeah. It's not like oh, I wrote two articles for my club and hire me now. Yeah. <laughs> got a stack of them. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. I will say if you do go down the grassroots uh, sport avenue, be strategic about which club you pick. Yeah. Because the contacts at every club are not made equal. Like yeah. Some of them, as you will know, will connect you to Gil McLaughlin. <laughs> <laughs> Others, you know, won't have as big a network. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. think strategically, maybe put some feelers out um, and find out where's a really good club to, to get involved at. Brilliant. Well, I like that segment. It's fantastic. Mm. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question or ask our friends in sport a question, sign up to become a Sports Grab member. Each week we jump on a Q&A, as Ruse mentioned before, where it's an open floor for you to ask us or industry professionals any of your questions. So this Wednesday we've got a, a live Ask Sports Grad event. Um, that's just one of many events you get access to as being part of a member. And all these Q&As are recorded. So when you join, you get immediate access to over 50 hours of exclusive content, which is essentially like Netflix for the sports industry, which is uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, let's wrap it up. Find us on LinkedIn. Plus, give us some love with a rating if you enjoy the show. Subscribe on Apple or follow on Spotify. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Hey, guys. One last thing before you go. If you'd enjoy a quick email from us each Friday on all the latest job openings, networking events, Q&As with industry professionals and latest podcast episodes, then subscribe to the Sports Grad newsletter head to our website www.sportsgrad.com.au forward slash newsletter to subscribe. There's also a link in our show notes to join.